Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you're doing well. This is the Ansible 101 live stream, episode five. We're going to talk about playbooks, uh, handlers, variables, and Ansible Vault, and we'll see where we get. Uh, there's a good deal of content to cover today, so I'm not going to spend too much time uh, introducing and, and saying hello. But it, as as with all these live streams, it'd be great if you put in the live stream chat if you can uh, where you're from and. Uh, and we can see where, where people are, are coming from and, and visiting from during these live streams. Something that's a little more fun than me pre-recording these and putting them out there because we can kind of interact with each other and learn from each other as well. Um, there's, there's always plenty of uh, good comments after the fact and also some good things during the chat that, that can help increase our knowledge of Ansible together. Um, but hello to everybody. Uh, hi to everybody who's already, already said hello in chat. Um, I, I saw Oliver yesterday at the, the Drupal live stream too, so thanks for coming to that. Um, having some fun upgrading my personal website, jeffgeerling.com. And for uh, people who weren't on the stream last week, I have an Ansible content site called ansible.jeffgeerling.com that lists all of the Ansible, uh, all the Ansible collections, roles, playbooks, operators, etc. that I work on. So if you want to see a central list of all that, that'd be great. Um, Good to see you guys. Uh, I see Ireland, Brazil, Las Vegas, Kansas City, Sierra Leone, uh, the Netherlands. Um, today I was going to wear my one of my Netherlands soccer jerseys, but instead I, I decided to wear my St. Louis Blues shirt um, in honor of the NHL season that may never complete. Uh, but the good thing is for me, being a St. Louisan, we are technically still the Stanley Cup champions. The, when we might be the only top, the only team in the NHL that won it one year and were champions for two. So, you know, I'm not going to complain too much about that. I see India, Finland, London, London uh, more from the Netherlands, Nepal, Switzerland, Virginia, Germany. It's great to see a global audience, and I hope that I am uh, able to help help you learn some new skills in these these episodes. Uh, I'm going to switch over to my screen share so that we can take a look at what uh, what we'll work on today. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank again Device42, uh, who has sponsored giving away my books Ansible for DevOps and Ansible for Kubernetes free for another month. Uh, if you don't have a copy, please go to leanpub.com and search for Ansible for DevOps. Grab your free copy now, because uh, it will only be av available for another week or so until the end of April. Uh, but thank you to Device42, to device and I told him I'd give him a plug in this live stream for uh, sponsoring that extra month. And Ansible is a great tool for driving IT automation, but to make the automation work, you need to make sure you have an accurate real-time picture of your IT infrastructure, and that's where Device42 helps. They provide comprehensive discovery of your entire IT estate from mainframes to Kubernetes. And just like Ansible, it's agentless. You can try it for free. Download a trial at device42.com and see how it can take your Ansible automation to the next level. So, I also wanted to thank uh, all the people who are sponsoring me on GitHub and Patreon. Uh, I've, I've been able to expand some of my open source work, and I don't know if, if you follow along with some of my projects. I've had a little more time lately to do PR reviews and try to uh, comment on issues, that type of thing. And the more sponsorship money I get, uh, the more I'm able, able to do that and focus on that, um, just because it, it doesn't generate any revenue, like it doesn't that work is all done for free, and so any work that I do on it, I'm basically donating that time. And uh, it's time that I I can spend outside of my family life uh, doing doing open source work. The more the more that I can get sponsorship money, the more I can justify doing that more uh, outside of my normal work and my normal uh, family time. So uh, if you aren't already uh, sponsoring me and have the means to do so, that would be awesome if you could consider doing that on GitHub. Uh, or uh, patronizing me on Patreon, I guess it's called. Um, and last last week we we had an episode going over our first Ansible playbook, and there were some questions about. Um, let me switch my windows over here. There were some questions about uh, different things. One person had a question about playbooks and roles. Is it better to have all their playbooks in one Ansible playbook as roles, or make different playbooks for each role? That kind of thing. We can also talk about tags, which we might get to today. Um, that's an organizational question that I will probably get to in the next episode when we start talking about Ansible roles. 
I haven't talked about roles yet, and uh, you don't need to know what they are yet if you don't know what they are yet, because uh, we'll get to the next episode. But there's in Ansible, there's a lot of different ways to organize your code. And <clears throat> in some cases, it doesn't really matter what you do. There are some times when it, it's better to do it one way or the other, but it, it really depends on what type of project you're managing and what type of person or team you have that's gonna maintain this stuff. Uh, another person mentioned, because <clears throat> I think I said in the, in the episode last week that uh, double quotes and single quotes don't usually matter that much in playbooks. There are some times when you're using the line and file module, which you might use here and there. I, I think I even have an example we'll go over today using it. Um, <clears throat> that regular expression characters can behave differently depending on the type of quotes you're using. So be careful of that. And if you have errors with it, always check your quotes. I mean, that's in bash scripts and Ansible playbooks and PHP and Python, every, everything that you write when you have double quotes and single quotes, sometimes you can screw things up. Um, and then another person um, was mentioning that they, they often have problems, <coughs> especially when you're getting started with Ansible, when you're writing YAML, you might not be familiar with uh, spaces and, and how to make sure that you don't have the, the, that you have the right amount of white space before a line, that you're doing tabs correctly. And so a lot of times they have syntax errors when they go to run their playbooks. And uh, this was actually a comment on my blog post about YAML best practices, but it comes back to something that we talk about on, this, uh, on these uh, Ansible 101 streams. And I mentioned that there's a few different things you can do. I'm not gonna go into them right now, uh, but there's a few things you can do to lint your code and lint your YAML using a, a program called YAML lint. Uh, and you can also use Ansible lint to give you more Ansible specific linting. And that will help you to uh, immediately see where, where there's potential problems in your code. That's not gonna say that the Ansible is all correct, but the YAML itself, you can make sure that it's correct by integrating those things with your code editor. And we'll talk a little bit about that in two episodes. The next, next episode, I'm hoping we get to Ansible roles, and then the episode after that, we'll, talking about, uh, we'll talk about testing, Ansible lint, YAML lint, and Molecule, and we'll get as far as we can there. Uh, but that also assumes that I have a little bit of time in the next couple of weeks to finish rewriting. Uh, I, th I forget what chapter it is, 8, 9, or 10 or something in the book on uh, testing with Ansible. Uh, but we'll, we'll get there. Even if I don't finish rewriting the chapter, we'll get there in the Ansible 101 series. Uh, so those were some of the questions from last week. Please feel free to continue asking questions in live chat, or uh, sometimes I miss them just because there's a lot of scroll back. Um, but uh, if I do miss it, please leave a comment in, in the video below. And if you like this content, go ahead and click the like button. Um, and I wanted to mention that in, um, in the next week or two, I'm gonna be adding some content on YouTube. I'm gonna start exploring uh, Kubernetes clusters with Raspberry Pis. Uh, this, if you have never seen it before, is my Raspberry Pi Dramble. If you go to pydramble.com, uh, you can see more about it, how to build it, um, the, the Ansible playbook that's used to build it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this is the culmination of like six or seven years of exploring Raspberry Pi based clusters. And I have a new thing coming uh, a new prototype coming in the next few days that I'm going to be exploring on the YouTube channel. So if you're interested in that uh, or other Raspberry Pi based things, I I have a lot of content like that from time to time that I post on YouTube. So right below me, there's a subscribe button. Click that button and you'll get that content as well. Uh, but I will be continuing the Ansible 101 series for sure. Uh, but there will also be some new stuff coming, coming for Raspberry Pi soon. Uh, so let is, let's get into chapter five. Uh, and I, again, I'm, I'm working from version 1.21 in this book, uh, but I think the latest version is 1.22. And by the time you're watching this video, if you're not watching it live, it might be version 1.25 or 2.6 or some other version of the book. Uh, so uh, somebody mentions K3S on the Pi. I actually am not using K3S yet. Uh, right now I'm still running Kubernetes K8S uh, directly on the Pis, but uh, it is something that I'm exploring. And Marcus is mentioning, I'm already on my new MacBook. Yeah, you might notice that this week the stream quality is a bit improved. Not only that, my computer's actually running and not dying. Uh, that is due directly to the donation from Device42. I was able to get a new laptop uh, to do these streams in much higher quality. So again, thank you to them. And thank you to all the sponsors who are uh, making, it, making me able to do more of this stuff. 
So we're going to get into chapter five now. Uh, I have, for today, I have two servers running. I created an inventory file. I have both of these servers are running in Amazon EC2, and I just created them in the EC2, um, the UI on, on Amazon Amazon's console. Uh, so I have a CentOS server, and I configured it up here, and I have an Ubuntu server, and I configured it here. And so I can target them using the group name of CentOS or Ubuntu. And uh, you, may, you might be familiar with this playbook that we, this was one of the first things that we created a, a few weeks ago. Uh, just a quick Ansible playbook that installs Apache on the server, and it makes sure that Apache is running. And so I'm going to run that playbook uh, on the CentOS server, host CentOS, and we'll see if it works. Ansible playbook dash i inventory, and then uh, the playbook's name is apache.yaml. I think I used to call it Apache, but I believe it's Apache now. Um, and I just realized that I have state absent, so that's that's why this is failing. Because if you uninstall the package, then it won't be able to start the package. So I'm going to put present for that, and we'll try running that again. So this playbook installs Apache. The service name, uh, the the package name is HTTPD, and the service name is HTTPD. Uh, so it makes sure that that's started. Uh, and we, we talked a little bit about handlers before and their purpose and, and how to use them and all that stuff. So I'm going to add a handler here for restarting Apache because sometimes when you're making a playbook, you'll need to do something and then make sure that the service is restarted. Uh, and that's typically what handlers are used for, but there's other things you can use them for too, which we'll talk about. Um, so I'm going to call this one restart Apache and I'll put service name HTTP state restarted. And now I have a handler, but if I run the playbook, it's not going to call this handler because nothing is telling Ansible to use this handler. Uh, but the one good thing about handlers is handlers are tasks. They're the same as any other task. I could copy this out and create a handler for it. So you could have a handler that installs a package. There's, I haven't ever had to do that, but I'm guessing maybe there's some reason that you'd want to do that someday. But a handler is just a task. And the name of the handler is used to notify it to run. Uh, and you'll notice that I usually write my, my uh, comment, my, my documentation, the name for each task as a full sentence with a period or a full stop at the end. Uh, but for handlers, I just use a simple, all lowercase, uh, very simple thing like restart Apache or notify something or, or change something, that kind of thing. Just because when you call a handler, like we'll do down here, I'm going to add a task that says name, uh, copy, test, config, file. And I'm going to use the copy module to do that. Source, I have a test.config file, which is an Apache virtual hosts file. I'm going to use that as a source. Files, test.config. Dest is going to be, I know in uh, CentOS 7, it's etsy slash httpd. HTTPD slash config.d slash test.config. I want to send it there. And when I copy up this configuration file, I want to have Apache restart because otherwise Apache won't know about this new configuration file. So I'm going to go ahead and say notify restart Apache. And what this does is when this task runs, if it changes something, so if, if you see, or like when it's okay, it's not going to change anything, so it won't do anything. But if it, set, if it results in a change, it will call this, this handler. It'll, it'll add it to the stack of handlers to be called at the end of the playbook. And at the end of the playbook, Ansible will run this handler. So let's try this again now that we have this copy test config file. And it should not only copy the config file up, but since it reports a change, it should also, at the end of the playbook, restart Apache, which it didn't because I, I think I tested this earlier and that config file was already there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this config file. I'll add a comment to it, and that will result in an actual change. And I should probably retest things before I uh, try them in these demos. But anyway, so now it's resulting in a change, and you can see at the end of the playbook, it runs a handler. And so it restarts Apache, and on the server, Apache is now restarted. Uh, this is the simplest case for a handler. And uh, there's a few different things that you can do to, to go a little more advanced. So one thing is you might want to 
immediately restart Apache instead of waiting till the end of the playbook. So one thing that you could do, and in this playbook it doesn't really matter that much because it's only managing Apache, that's it. But if you had a playbook that did 150 different tasks and you wanted to make sure that Apache was restarted right away and it didn't wait until all the 150 tasks were done, you can do something called flush handlers using Ansible's meta, meta module. So I'm gonna say name, make sure handlers are flushed immediately. And then I'm gonna use the meta task and say flush handlers. And I'm gonna go ahead and change this file again. Well, f before I do that, I'm going to comment this out. I'll just show you if it doesn't, if it doesn't result in a change, which we actually did the first time, if it doesn't result in a change, it's not gonna notify that handler, so the handler won't run. You can see that it doesn't say running handler here. Uh, but if we do cause a change, so I'm gonna remove this comment again so it changes the file, and I add this flush handlers, it will notify the handler right away after this. So if I go like this, it'll make the change, and then you can see immediately it, it restarts that it restarts Apache. It catches this and restarts it. Uh, so that's one way to control when handlers are flushed instead of hang, having them at the end of the playbook. Now, another thing that can happen that might trip you up sometimes because you might say, I want to copy this file, restart Apache, and then you know at the end of the playbook it gets restarted. If, if that has to happen, if Apache has to be restarted by the end of the playbook, and let's say some other thing that you do later in the playbook fails, the the handler could uh, actually never run because Ansible by default won't run handlers if the play fails on a host. But you can you can work around that problem. So let's let's add a task that's going to fail. Ansible conveniently has a module called fail that can do that. And so if I run it without any changes, it'll just get to that failure and fail, and that that's not a big deal, which it will do here. However. Uh, if I change this file, so I'm going to add a comment again and then run this again. I, I change the file and it notifies the restart handler, but you'll notice that it won't actually run the handler. So it, it, goes, it gets to here, but it doesn't actually do it. Up here, when we saw restart Apache, it actually reported the change because it did it. Down here it says I wanted to do it, but it didn't actually do it because there was a failure. You can overcome that by passing, uh, let me get back to my notes here. Uh, you can pass the uh, flag to the playbook force, force handlers, I think it is. I can say force handlers, and I'm going to have to make that change to this file again. Uh, force handlers will, will make it run the handler even if the play fails on a given host. So it's running, changes the file, and it's still going to restart that, restart Apache and run that handler. So there's, there's a few things to keep in mind when you're using handlers. One is to don't presume that they will always be running. Uh, another one is to know that they run at the end of your playbook unless you use that meta flush handlers uh, uh, module. So you know it, some, some things that you might need to keep in mind when you're, when you're working with handlers. And another thing to keep in mind is all these top level things. The, uh, an Ansible playbook is a YAML file that has keys and values, a dictionary basically. Uh, and a list of plays. So this doesn't have to be defined at the top. You can actually define it at the bottom if you want. Uh, it, it's just up to your style that you want to have uh, defined handlers, tasks, roles, whatever other types of things in your playbook that you're defining. I usually define mine at the top just so that I can have a reference when I'm looking at a playbook uh, what handlers I have available to me. Uh, another thing that's interesting that you might want to do sometimes is uh, let's say whenever you restart your web server, you also have something else that you need restarted, restarted. There are two ways to do that. One is I can add a handler. So let's say name restart memcached. Uh, memcached is a, a key value uh, caching system, basically. It's a really simple thing, kind of like Redis. And a lot of people use it to uh, store data that's cached in front of a database or something like that. And let's say Whenever you change your Apache configuration, you also want to restart memcache to clear out its cache. Uh, so I'm going to say service name memcached, whoops, memcached state restarted. And one way that you can do this is notify can actually be a list. It doesn't have to be just a string like it was here. 
I can make notify a list like this and say restart memcached. And I actually have memcached running on the server already. I don't have it in this playbook, but I have it on that particular server so I can demonstrate this. And I'm going to take this fail out as well because we want the playbook to run. Um, and then I'll make a change to this file again. I'll just remove this comment completely. And now what it should do is it should notify both of these handlers and then Ansible will at the end of the playbook, ideally, restart Apache and restart memcache. So let's see if that works. I can take out the force handlers. Oh, somebody from Russia too and Ghana. Hello to all of you. And let's see, so it restarts Apache and it restarts memcache. Now, if, if it's a handler that always needs to do something else after that handler runs, or if let's say you're using one of Ansible's notification modules, like you're using the Slack module to, to ping a Slack channel and say, hey, this deployment's finished, and you want that to happen whenever Apache's restarted or something like that, uh, you can notify a handler directly, or a handler, since it's just a normal Ansible task, can actually notify another handler. So I'm going to say notify restart memcached like that. And then if I remove that from here, we'll see what happens. I'm going to change this file again, add a comment to it. Um, and now I'm just notifying the restart Apache handler, which is going to call this. But since I'm notifying from that handler another handler, it should do both still. So it should do the same as the above. So let's see if that's the case. And you can see it did both of them. So it just illustrates that handlers are basically Ansible tasks that can be called by using the notify uh, property on any other task. Uh, so it, it, they, can be, they can be very powerful if you need them to, need them to be able to do things from, from other tasks reacting to different changes or different situations. Uh, I'm not going to get so much deeper here. There, there's a few examples later in the book, and we might or might not get to those examples in the Ansible 101 series. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways to use handlers, and uh, typically it, it's simple like this. If you start doing really complicated things and having a large chain of handlers, there might be a better way to, to manage that. Um, but this is, this is how I use handlers mostly, just restarting services or notifying somebody in a Slack channel uh, or sending off uh, an API request that says, like, something's done, uh, that kind of thing. So that is handlers. I'm going to remove this memcached handler just for now and we'll keep this playbook uh, because we'll use it for some other things uh, momentarily. And the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is environment variables. Uh, Ansible works with environment variables many different ways. Um, and Marcus is asking about notifying handlers on another machine. That's a little more advanced and I'm not going to get into that particular topic today. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we're working with one server right now. Uh, this is just one CentOS server. When you work with multiple servers, which we will do later in this streaming series, is uh, it, there are some, some things that you have to keep in mind with how that works, like targeting one particular server in a set of servers. Uh, for instance, if you're doing a database operation, you might not want to do it on all your servers at the same time because that could cause errors. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, and uh, people are asking about how to get the book. Uh, look in the description below this video. There's a link to the books. Uh, there's a link to support me on GitHub. There's a link to support me on Patreon. Uh, there's all the information that you need down there. Uh, anyway, so environment variables. Uh, one of the simplest ways that you can work with environment variables is you can actually uh, set the environment in the remote users uh, session, which Ansible will then pick up because it's an SSH connection, it'll pick it up just like any other SSH connection would pick up the user's environment variables when you run commands remotely. Uh, so one way to do that, one way to manage the remote environment, uh, I'm actually going to log into the server uh, here uh, to show how one would typically manage their own environment, uh, SSH sent to us on that server. And uh, there are some some files in, if you're using bash, there will be these type of files, bash rc, bash history, bash profile. Uh, if you're using zsh or if you're using fish or some other terminal thing, then, then your environment would be stored in one of those variables. But in this case, and for most systems, bash is, is standard. Uh, so we can set environment variables for this user in the bash profile. So I'll see what's in there right now. 
Uh, right now there's a path to find and that's about it. And it also is going to load your bash RC uh, if that's present, which it is. Um, so if we wanted to, we can just drop an environment variable in, into here. And the simplest way to do that is using Ansible's line and file module. There's definitely better ways to do it if you're managing environment variables uh, and, and bash profile or your, your global environment. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, but, um, but this, is, this is the simplest, quickest way. Uh, so I'm gonna say name, add an environment variable to the remote user's shell. And I'm gonna use the line in file module. And you can look up documentation either using Ansible doc on the command line or just searching it on Google and going to Ansible's documentation site. Uh, so I'm gonna say dest is uh, dot bash profile in the home folder. Uh, and uh, the, I'll, I'll tell you how this works in just a second. Rig x equals var uh, like that. Uh, line is and var equals value. And these are just placeholders. These and var doesn't mean anything. It's just environment variable. Uh, so what this, what the line and file module does is if you give it uh, a file, a dest, so that it's, it's telling us, look at the bash profile file right here. And then you give it a regular expression. Uh, and actually, I don't think I need a space there. And then you give it a line. Uh, the line will be placed in the file wherever it finds this. And you can, there's, there's other options that you can use to, to say like insert after the end of the file or before the start of the file or that kind of thing. But by default, it'll just inject this at the end of the file if it's not already there. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this playbook. <clears throat> and here, and it should be in this file now. So if I cat the file, <clears throat> it's not there. Uh, oh, and that the reason for that is because I'm using become so it's in the the root users uh, the root users bash profile. I actually want this in the sent to us user that I'm logging in as, so I can check it out here. So I'll I'll actually mention this now. I was going to mention it later, uh, but you can you can use uh, you can turn off become basically for any task. So right now I'm I'm becoming the root user for all tasks and all handlers in the playbook because it's required for these things, uh, but it's not required for this. So I'm going to say become false, or you can say no, or you can say zero, but I'm going to say false because I like being particular like that. And now it should actually change the file in the sent to us user because it's not going to become the root user. And we can see that it added envir environment variable equals value there. <clears throat> Excuse me while I grab another drink. <clears throat> So if we wanted to get, a, <coughs> get an environment variable like that, uh, one note is that Ansible's shell module is required to work with environment variables easily at least. And <coughs> the simplest way to grab an environment variable, I'm gonna say name, uh, get the value of an environment variable. Uh, and then I'm gonna use the shell module. And I'll use uh, source dash, uh, that bash profile uh, and echo var. And I'm gonna use Ansible's register functionality. And what I can do here is it's basically gonna run the command using shell because I'm using, uh, I'm using the ampersands to, to, uh, to do the next task if this one succeeds. And I'm using echo the command module kind of doesn't work with this, this scenario. So you got to use the shell module to be able to do this. Uh, but I can get the environment variable out of here and this is going to output it to the screen, but Ansible doesn't know about that unless you tell it to register that variable. And then you can use this variable in the rest of your playbook, uh, but we're just going to see what's inside. So I'm going to use uh, the debug module. And again, I could put a name like debug. Uh, and use it this way. But I'm a lot of times when I'm debugging a playbook, I just throw debug in here. I'm going to say message uh, equals the variable is uh, foo.out. Uh, so 
when when you register a variable from the shell module or command, Ansible gives you a dictionary with the standard error, the standard output, uh, with standard out by line in an, in an array that you can look through that way. So if you know what line it's going to be on, the output that you need, you can just get it that way. And the uh, RC value and, and anything else about that command. Uh, but in this case, I know that it's going to be the, the output of this echo is going to be the value of the, the, value of the variable. So if I run this, I should see value output. Uh, the variable is value. And there it is right there. Uh, so that's one way to get, get environment variables out of Ansible, uh, out of the, the environment. And uh, if you wanted to, in addition to uh, setting, setting variables, environment variables for the particular user, you can set a global variable in Etsy uh, environment. Uh, and that, that will let you set system-wide variables that can then be used later. There's a few gotchas with this. One is if you're using Ansible and you have uh, the SSH is configured the, uh, with, um, what is it, chaining, or I, I forget the name of the, the uh, configuration setting for it. But if you have the environment set from an earlier task, uh, you, you need to reload the environment or override your, your variable values to be able to use the environment in later tasks. But uh, I'm also going to talk about how you can set environment uh, variables for particular tasks and for playbooks to overcome that, because this is, this is more for setting, setting environment variables that are on the server and will persist on that server. Uh, but uh, I'll get into that now. Uh, let's see. And I'm sorry if this, this chapter is a little bit hard to, uh, to go through in kind of a step-by-step -step fashion, just because this, this chapter and chapter 5 in the book kind of goes through a lot of different things and I don't have a structured example for it, mostly because there's no easy way to get through all these different things with one structured example. Um, but anyway, so we'll talk about uh, task-based environment setting uh, and playbook-based environment setting. So for any given task, so let's say um, uh, name download a file and let's see, I'm just going to grab bandwidth test file. So I'm just going to grab a test file here. We'll grab a small file. Copy link. And I'm going to use git URL. URL is that. Uh, dust is, we'll just do it in temp. And uh, let's say, so, so this will work because this particular server doesn't have a proxy set up. But let's say you're using a proxy, and this is something that happens quite a bit in a corporate environment. Um, when, when, you're, when you're working with proxies, you need to make sure that you have like the HTTP proxy, the HTTPS proxy, maybe the FTP proxy, other proxies all set in the environment. Otherwise, uh, utilities that do downloads and utilities that interact with uh, external services won't go through the proxy and they'll fail. Uh, so the simplest way to do this is just set environment and you can set things like HTTP proxy, and then you can set your proxy for it. So, you know, if, like example proxy uh, 80, something like that, whatever your corporate proxy is or your, your uh, cloud proxy that you're going through. And you can do the same for HTTPS uh, like that. And since I don't have a proxy set up, it's not going to work here. Uh, but another thing that you can do, like let's say you have five or six tasks that you need to define this for, uh, you can actually set these things in in a variable. So we'll go up to the top of the playbook and say vars, and we'll say proxy vars, and we'll put these up here like this. And then instead of defining defining these for each thing, you can say environment proxy vars, and it will inject these variables into your environment. Uh, wherever it is in the in the play, in the uh, wherever this exists in a task, another place that you can set the variables though is on the on the uh, play level. So it, it can be a, a universal thing that applies to all tasks in your play. So you can set environment like this, and then you don't even have to set it there because it applies to the entire play and all tasks inside of it. Uh, so there's a few different ways to set those uh, environment variables that are just specific to a play or tasks. And note that the reason I mentioned earlier that you can set global environment on the server itself is these 
these environment variables will uh, apply to each task in a play or to a play itself, but it won't be persisted on the server. So the next time you run the playbook or if you have other automation running on the server or if you're trying to control things on the server that need environment variables, these won't be persisted on the server. You still need to inject the environment variables uh, that way uh, into the Etsy environment file or into a bash profile or, or wherever the, it needs to be on the server so that your systems and applications can see them. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Aaron mentions that sometimes proxies need credentials. And, uh, and that is true. I'm not going to cover proxy credentials in this particular 101 uh, stream just because it's already 30 minutes in. We have plenty to cover today, uh, but we will talk about Ansible Vault and how you can keep secrets secret. Um, a few, few more notes on variables that we'll, that we'll uh, talk about. We've, we've, done it, we've added variables to playbooks a few different ways. Uh, one way is we added vars up here, and you can directly add a variable. Uh, like that. Uh, we've also added vars files, and you can give it a file. So like, let's say uh, vars slash main.yaml. And then I can create a folder called vars, and inside file called uh, main.yaml, like that. And we'll add the same variable here. Uh, so both of these do the same exact thing. We have a, a an included vars file or uh, vars defined inline in the playbook. These both do the exact same thing. It's just easier to organize. If you have lots of variables, it's easier, easier to organize them in external variable files. Um, but I wanted to show an example of, of, one of the, one of the things that you can do when you use vars files and include them with Ansible since it's all dynamic. Uh, and that is to make a playbook that runs on multiple environments or multiple operating systems in this particular case, uh, we're going to get Apache to install both on uh, CentOS and on the Ubuntu server. And Ubuntu and Debian are similar. CentOS and Red Hat and Fedora are similar. So it, basically, we, we're going to take this playbook that right now only works on Red Hat-based systems and make it work on both Red Hat and Ubuntu uh, using some dynamic variables. Uh, so the first thing is, uh, HTTPD is the name of the package and the service on uh, CentOS, but on Ubuntu it's a little different. So first of all, I'm going to say uh, I'm going to make this a variable so it'll be easier for us to manage it. Uh, so I'm going to say vars um, Apache serv Apache package is HTTPD, Apache service is HTTPD, and now I can go up here and say the Apache package is this, and I'm going to put it there and uh, remember I mentioned this earlier, and whenever you're using the handlebars, which is Jinja syntax to paste in a variable basically, whenever you're using them in this syntax, I always surround them in quotes, uh, otherwise it's not valid YAML. Uh, you can see that my YAML, my YAML syntax highlighting actually makes that apparent. Uh, so I always surround them in double quotes. Uh, and then I'm going to put the service in here, uh, right here. And right here, oops. Okay, so now now this playbook will run the same. If I run it here, it'll still run the same, but it's going to use these variables. Uh, but what happens if I run this playbook on Ubuntu? I'll switch this. Remember, in my inventory, I have a CentOS group up here and a Ubuntu group here. So I'm going to switch this to Ubuntu, and it's not going to work because Ubuntu uses different names for Apache. You can see that it can't find uh, package HTTP has no installation candidate. That means it can't find HTTPD. So for Ubuntu, this needs to change to uh, Apache 2. And the service name is going to be Apache 2, I believe. We'll see if that works. I'm just operating on memory here. And my brain always gets a little bit scrambled since I usually work on four different distros depending on the projects that I'm working on in a given day. Uh, let's see. Yeah, oh, okay, so another thing that's happening is this is not the right configuration directory on Ubuntu because the config directory name is different too. Uh, so I'm going to say Apache config dir, and it's this on CentOS, but on Ubuntu it's Apache 2 
Uh, and actually, the, the config for virtual hosts is in sites enabled, I believe. So we'll do that, and I, I think that'll work. We'll see. Again, I'm operating completely on memory, and uh, sometimes my brain gets a little scrambled. Uh, oh, I didn't actually use this variable. That would be the problem. Uh, so I'm going to do that here. And again, since I'm using Jinja, I'm going to surround this in double quotes to make it valid syntax and run that here. And someone's talking about, uh, oh, using the correct ma package manager. You might notice that this actually worked on Ubuntu. The task is yum. That's actually a bug. It's not a horrible, terrible bug. But the yum module and the uh, pacman module and the apt module and the package module, they all actually kind of in a weird way go back to package and find the right package manager. But yes, uh, to be more distro agnostic, it's better to use the package module, which it makes it explicit that I'm installing a package and use whatever system is best there. Uh, so good for pointing that out. I actually found out about that, and I posted a bug on Ansible's uh, issue queue uh, a few months ago about that. Uh, it's a very weird situation. Actually, I think that only affects the yum module. If you use apt on CentOS, it fails. But if you use yum on Debian, it actually succeeds because yum is kind of an alias to DNF and through the package module or something weird like that. Anyway, by the time you're watching this video, that, might, that bug might have been fixed. Uh, but it, this all works now. Uh, but if I switch it back to CentOS, I'll wait for the playbook run to finish. If I switch it back to CentOS, it's going to fail. So I want to make this uh, work on both operating systems. And I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is include two variable files. One is going to have the default variables, and one of them will have the variables for a specific distribution. Uh, so you can do that in Ansible using vars files. And I'm going to give it apache default.yaml. And I'm going to use a special variable. And I'll tell you more about these in a minute. Apache Ansible OS family.yaml. And what I can do is take these variables out. So I'll just delete them from this file. And I'm going to create a file. Um, actually, I'll put these in a vars folder. Vars new file, and this will be called apache default.yaml. And I'm going to put these in here. And my default will be uh, the Ubuntu settings. So this will be the defaults. But I want to create another file called new file. Uh, and this will be apache sent os.yaml. I think that's what it needs to be. And then I'm going to change this to HTTPD and change this to that slash config.d. So now I have the different settings for sent to us. And what this is going to do is it's going to load the default variables no matter what. And then it's going to see if there's a file for this. If there is, it's going to load those values. If there's not, then it won't, and it'll fall back to the defaults. So. Um, if I run this playbook again, I believe it will load the CentOS files here. Uh, da, da, da. Why is it not finding that? Uh, Apache CentOS. Do I need quotes on it? I don't believe so. Uh, this, this might actually be a change in the way that uh, Ansible uh, does vars files from when the book was written. And this is another reason why you should always rehearse things beforehand. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, what is it, vars uh, with first found or something like that. Uh, actually, uh, So this is this is a little different. This did change in Ansible 2. Point something recently, I believe, because uh, it is somebody's mentioned gather facts in this this special variable, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add pre tasks uh, and name load variable files, and I'm going to use uh, include vars instead. 
like that wonderful stack overflow question says ah i can't type with first found and that's i use this instead and it, i wasn't going to describe uh, for, with first found until sometime later but uh we'll see uh with first found copy that out and delete this part now what this is going to do is it, this is a third way of, of loading variables into an Ansible playbook using include vars. And it's using the with first found uh, loop. So it's going to go through and it's going to see if there's a file like this. And if there's not that, then it's going to load this one, I believe. And we'll see if that works. Uh, so it found Apache default. It didn't find OS family. I wonder... What is the OS family? Maybe that's my problem here. Debug. Maybe the OS family is actually Red Hat and not sent to us, which means I have a bug in my book that I need to fix, which I should actually note to myself uh, so that I can fix this. Uh, yeah, it's Red Hat. So I need to name this Red Hat live debugging my book in front of an audience. Always a fun thing. So let's try that and see if it loads that. All right, so this time it worked because we're actually doing the right thing and my book was wrong. Shame on whoever wrote this thing. Anyway, so what this is doing uh, instead of the wrong way is the right way is in Ansible 2.4 or 5, I forget what version, it, it stopped letting you use dynamic uh, variable names in the vars files uh, directive for a playbook. So now the best way to do it is to use the include vars module, which will load variables uh, from a file the same way. Uh, but you can use with first found, which will find a file. And if it doesn't find it, so if I switch back to Ubuntu here, and then I run this, whoops, and then I run this playbook again, uh, then it should still work because it won't find the Red Hat file because this is Ubuntu, but it'll still load the default vars, which is here. Uh, so sorry about the technical difficulties, but that's life working with Ansible sometimes. Uh, so looks like that works. And, and since I have this playbook now working for both servers, I can actually change this to all, and it will run on all the different servers, so CentOS and Ubuntu at the same time and it will dynamically load the variables that are correct for that particular server, and it should load everything and install everything correctly, which it seems to be doing here. Yeah, and people are mentioning on the chat too that it is Red Hat and not sent to us, so thank you for finding that and pointing that out. Um, the wonderful benefit of live streaming. If this were pre-recorded, you wouldn't have seen that, that uh, the, the secret behind how I actually do things. I just search Stack Overflow and find answers from other people that fix my problems. I think that's how 90% of programming is anyways. Um, so that is, uh, that is using dynamic inventory files uh, based on OS family. I, I do this a lot in a lot of my roles because I work with Fedora, Ubuntu, sometimes Amazon Linux, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, Debian, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, that's, that's one way to get variables for different types of systems that way. And if you wanted to support more systems, you just add another variable file for that system if it has different settings. Um, let's see, what else am I missing in this? Uh, there's a few other things that I, I didn't mention. Like one is where does this Ansible OS family thing come from? That's what I, I like to call the magic variables, but it's, it's facts that Ansible gathers about a system. And you can, you can actually get all these facts. Um, I have a, a note about it in the book, which I'm not finding right now. Uh, but it's you can get all the facts that Ansible knows about your system using the setup module. So either in a playbook or just using Ansible, uh, I can say inventory sent to us uh, dash M setup. And I believe I mentioned this in one of the earlier live streams, but this, this module gives you all of the things that Ansible can figure out about a system. And you can use that to change things in your playbook. Like for instance, if you have a, a database that you want to use half of the machine's available memory, you can get the Ansible mem total MB and then half that and use that value in your config file. Uh, but it has things like the Ansible OS family, uh, the FQDN, the host name for it, uh, the, the IPv4 address, IPv6 address, all that kind of stuff is, is in this. 
Uh, you can get the Ansible distribution. So I think in the book, I might have used Ansible distribution when I started working on it, and then I changed to OS Family, but never updated the text to use Red Hat instead of sent to us. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> that, that kind of thing happens. Um, but you can even get things like the version of the distribution, so you can flag on if I'm on Red Hat 7 versus Red Hat 6 versus Red Hat 8, that kind of thing. Uh, but those are all things that Ansible gets when you gather facts. If you, if you have a playbook and you have gather facts no or false, uh, then it won't get these types of things, and then this would fail because it won't know the family. In fact, I'll, I'll show you how that looks. Uh, sometimes you run a playbook and it's not gathering facts, and so it will fail on the sent to us machine because it doesn't know, um, it, it didn't pick up this file because it didn't have this fact available to it. So, uh, let's see, anything else? We talked about registering a variable. Uh, pretty much any, any task that you have, you can register. So I could do register. Oh, my computer's starting to be a tiny bit slow. The, uh, the CPUs are still doing okay, but uh, anyway, we'll see how that works. Uh, so you can register any variable on any task, and if you say debug var equals foo, it'll get it. I'm going to remove this gather facts, and I'll just turn it on sent to us for now. Uh, but you can register a variable from any task and get information about that variable and use debug to see what's in it so that you can uh, get down to whatever you want from it. And another in interesting thing about uh, variables is there's there's different ways to drill down into the data. So this is all the data I got out of this task. I can see that it, it's uh, not changed, it's not failed, there was no message that was returned, the RC was zero, so it was successful, and it gave me the results, uh, a line from, I guess, the yum command saying, like, yum, ins is it installed, and it already is. Uh, so what I can do is I can say, if I just want the value of RC, I can say foo.rc, and if I run this again, it's gonna give me uh, a zero because that's the value of foo.rc. Uh, that's one way to access properties of a dictionary in, in uh, Python and in Jinja and Ansible. Uh, but another way is to use brackets. And I tend to use brackets when I'm being a little more formal because they, there are less surprises with brackets. So if I do foo rc like this, it'll give me the same value. And the reason this is important to know is if you always do foo dot RC, um, if you always use the dot, dot syntax to, to access properties, there are some things that will trip you up and cause errors. Like let's say the, the actual key is coming from Amazon and the key is like RC dash status or something like that. If you try doing that, it's gonna fail because there's a dash in the name and dashes are not uh, valid ways of accessing properties using the dot notation. So for this, you would always have to use uh, the, the square the square bracket syntax to be able to access properties. So something to keep in mind when you're, uh, when you're trying to access variable data uh, deeply nested inside of a dictionary, something like that. Because I've, I've done things like foo.fizz.buzz.something uh, and then access the first array item dot something else. And then you get an error and you're like, where does this error come from? It's because there's a dash in one of these keys. So you have to use for that. Uh, this syntax. And when you do that, it starts getting a little messy. So at that point, I'm like, okay, well, I'll, I'll just use that syntax for everything uh, because that, that way it's a little more consistent logically for me. Anyway, so that is, that is how to access variables and register variables. And again, every task in your playbook, I could put register on here. I could put it anywhere and get the information that comes back from that task. And Jay Main is asking, can we only get a few facts instead of all? There's a lot of different ways you can control facts coming from Ansible. Uh, one is obviously you can turn it off. You can say gather facts, no. Uh, but it's either no or everything. But you can also give Ansible a facts script. You can put a facts, like a Python script or anything that outputs facts uh, about a system into a special directory on the remote server. And then that script will be run when Ansible gathers its facts. But there's, there's other things you can do to control the facts. I'm not going to get too deeply into that because usually facts gathering is not a big deal. It only takes a couple seconds per server. And if it takes longer than that, there might be some other issues that you can fix that, that help with performance more than that. But um, 
but for something like uh, running on a on a Docker container or something, you might want to turn off fax gathering completely. Uh, but but I'm not going to get too much into that right now, uh, except to mention that if you also are used to uh, what are they? I have them listed in here. If you're used to things uh, from like Puppet or Chef like Factor or Ohai and you have them installed on your servers, Ansible will actually by default gather facts from those systems as well and, and mix them into the mix, uh, prefixed by Factor underscore and Ohai underscore. Uh, so that's, that's one convenience if you're working in multiple configuration management systems. Uh, and I do mention in the book on page 98 of this edition in chapter 5, uh, stuff about local facts that you can put onto a server. Uh, typically, I avoid doing that, though. Uh, I don't mess around too much with facts in Ansible just because I have the inventory managed outside of the servers themselves, so I make sure that I get the data into Ansible through my inventory system, whatever it is. For example, device 42. Uh, so the in information comes from there, and that way the servers themselves don't have to store any f special facts about themselves. Uh, that's just that's the way that I do it. But you, you know, as I say a lot, there's a lot of times, uh, a lot of different ways to do things. And what's the way the way that I do it is not always the right way. Uh, it's just the way that I do it. Uh, but you know, I believe it's the right way. That's why I do it. But it's not always the right way for everyone. Um, so uh, we've actually hit the end of of time for today. And I was just getting to Ansible Vault, and uh, it looks like it will have to stay a secret for another week. Uh, but next week, I'm going to talk about Ansible Vault and how to keep things secret in Ansible using Ansible Vault. And that, that should just be a short time. I'm not going to go super deep into Ansible Vault. Uh, but I will mention that Ansible Vault is a very convenient alternative to using a key management system for certain tasks and for certain things. Uh, if you just need to throw a secret into a playbook like a database password or something like that, it's a... It's a secure enough way to do that, and it doesn't require you to run external systems or servers to manage your, your secrets that you manage with that playbook. And it, it conveniently allows you to store secrets alongside your playbook in a place like source control, uh, as long as you can have that secret decrypted by Ansible using Ansible Tower or at runtime at the playbook. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that at, at the beginning of next episode, and then we'll talk about roles. Uh, how to organize your playbook a little more efficiently using roles instead of just having lots and lots of tasks inside one playbook. Uh, so we'll get into that next week. And then everybody keeps asking about this. Uh, every episode asking about how do I do linting? How do I do testing? How do you make it easier to see when you're going to have an error when you're writing a playbook in your, in your editor like this? Uh, so in two episodes, my plan is to talk about Molecule, Ansible Lint, and YAML lint and how you can integrate those with your workflow to make it easier to test and develop Ansible playbooks, Ansible roles, Ansible collections, and, and other Ansible content. Um, yes, Vault remains a secret for now. It is secret knowledge that you will gain by subscribing to the channel, which is right below me, and uh, coming back next week. I will bring up my little fancy social links at the bottom of the screen here. And um, I'll say again, thank you for watching. I'm, I hope that these videos are, are helping you. Uh, sorry about today. Today's was a little bit more difficult just because there was a lot of different uh, sections in Chapter 5 without one really cohesive example that I could get through. So I was kind of winging it. Uh, I don't know if you could tell by the fact that some of the playbooks kept failing. Um, uh, but I, I hope you'll come back next week. We'll talk about secrets, talk about roles. And uh, hope, hope that you're safe. Um, another quick little bit of news is next week is Red Hat Summit. And at Red Hat Summit, which is now going to be a virtual event, they're going to have some sessions on Ansible and OpenShift and things like that. So uh, consider registering for that. I think it's free now. Uh, I don't have the link to it, uh, but you can ask me on Twitter. Somebody might paste it in the live chat. Uh, but Red Hat Summit is always a worthwhile event, and especially this year since it's free. And there's a lot of really good sessions uh, that will be at it. So in addition to, of course, blocking out the 10 a.m. U.S. Central hour next Wednesday for this, you can watch the Red Hat Summit. Uh, so thank you. And I believe that now I, I kind of know when the end stream button actually ends the stream. So it probably won't cut me off mid-sentence. But thanks for